Hello and welcome to the Boston Echo Board Review course. Today we will be discussing a topic that I did not understand completely and now it's very near and dear to me. There's a lot of reasons for the apathy shown by the anesthesiologist towards diastolic function. Ignorance, denial, and so what attitude due to lack of a therapy specific to diastolic dysfunction is a few of the common reasons that are given for this a lack of interest. The recent American Society of Echocardiography guidelines that explicitly state that these guidelines are not applicable to the perioperative arena certainly serve to enhance this attitude of lack of interest towards diastolic function and dysfunction. Now, availability of a, a lack of evidence is one of the most commonly cited reasons for this exclusionary attitude towards the perioperative arena. However, we have all seen those patients who have normal systolic function and elevated left-sided filling pressures. Those patients who have normal systolic function and always are very easy to go into congestive heart failure postoperatively. Therefore, absence of evidence does not necessarily signify that there is evidence of absence. Today, it is my goal to explain to you a simplified nature of diastolic function and dysfunction and to make you appreciate its clinical value and its perioperative implications for the management of these difficult patients. So the dilemma that two patients having similar degree of systolic dysfunction yet being very different in their symptoms was a huge mystery. And not until the ready and practical clinical availability of Doppler were people able to understand the mysteries of diastole also. In that, in 1995, in a famous review article uh, by the Mayo Clinic people, they analogized the discovery of Doppler to the discovery of Rosetta Stone. Now, to give you a little lesson in history, in 1779, Napoleon's forces discovered a Rosetta Stone in the town of Rosetta in Egypt. It had three different kinds of languages written on it, the hieroglyphics, the demotic scripts, and ancient Greek. Well, nobody could decipher it for a while until 1799, a young physicist by the name Thomas Young deciphered and unlocked uh, the entire Egypt, Egyptology for the rest of the world. Interestingly, uh, Thomas Young was the same physicist who put forward the Young-Laplace law of pressure and compliance. So it was, so the, the reference of Doppler to Rosetta Stone was a very subtle yet a very beautiful reference to the same gentleman who unlocked both these mysteries to the rest of the world. Now, what Doppler did was that we were able to physiologically define the systole as we had read it biochemically like the uh, and see that in the form of waveforms in the form of rapid e wave that analogized to the rapid filling phase then comes the diastasis and then the atrial kick after that so it gave us an understanding of the way the heart fills so which means the rapid filling phase transforms to e wave and the atrial kick the latter part of the cardiac cycle so to simplify it the rapid filling phase analogized to pulling something into the heart, which is the pulling phase. And the atrial kick is when the heart actually pushes the blood into the left ventricle. This is a very important and a subtle difference that you have to recognize, that this is uh, an abnormality of either pulling the blood into the ventricle or pushing the blood into the left ventricle. So that is essentially one major understanding of diastolic dysfunction, that it could be an abnormality of pulling or abnormality of pushing the blood into the left ventricle, and that sets the standard for the rest of the understanding of diastolic function. So now we come to the phase where we have Doppler, and we decide and uh, diagnose filling abnormalities based on Doppler assessment of transmitral flow. However, very soon people realized that uh, left ventricular relaxation properties were one of the filling uh, characteristics so one of the factors that determine the left ventricular filling. There were other factors involved, which means left atrial pressure, left ventricular compliance, your heart rate. So uh, the relaxation alone was just one of the important determinants of how the left ventricle fills, but it is not the only one. And at this time, I'll draw in an analogy to diabetes, which means, and glucose levels. So glucose, uh, the most important determinant of blood glucose levels is insulin, but it is not the only one. And very soon people began also began to realize as far as diastolic function is concerned that you could have normal filling patterns despite having relaxation abnormalities. And that was because of the fact that as you got older, your suction or pulling power into the left ventricle was significantly diminished. 
that led to a gradual elevation of left atrial pressure. Now the left atrial pressure overcame the relaxation abnormalities and your filling, abnormal, filling prop pattern resembled that of a normal pattern and that was referred to as a pseudonormal pattern. So now came another, another phase where when uh, people began to analyze uh, the filling pattern of the pulmonary veins also. Now where that comes from is that during diastole when the mitral valve is open, the LV, the left atrium and the pulmonary veins are one continuous cavity. So an assessment of the filling pattern of the pulmonary veins into the left atrium uh, was con considered additive value of, uh, with the transmitral flow patterns to be able to put together a stage of diastolic function it was, or dysfunction. It was pretty complicated, and it is because not only is transmitral dependent on flow pattern dependent on filling abnormalities and, and other characteristics, so is pulmonary venous inflow pattern. So it just made it a little bit more complicated, not any better than that because you couldn't obtain them. Patients with irregular rhythms, they were out of sync with each other, the both transmital and the pulmonary venous inflow pattern, and therefore it didn't really make that much of a sense. And as I said, remember, so far we have read two or uh, discussed two most important things that I expect you to remember. One, either you can have a pulling abnormality, that's a relaxation abnormality, and secondly, you could have a pushing abnormality, which means you cannot push it into because the ventricle is so stiff. And the second one is an allergy of diabetes and blood glucose to diastolic dysfunction, where insulin being the most important determinant of uh, blood glucose levels, but not the only one, as is uh, left ventricular relaxation, the most important determinant of how the LV fills, but it certainly is not the most important one. So that's the second lesson that we learned today. So uh, with the knowledge of the fact that the regular pulse wave Doppler filling abnormalities or the filling patterns of left ventricle as well as pulmonary venous inflows were highly load dependent and therefore subject to change and vary with position with the preload and, and with a lot of other factors, heart rate and contractility as well. So then uh, other forms of Doppler and combinations of Doppler and M mode and color M mode were discovered to further refine the assessment of diastolic filling abnormalities. Now there's a host of you know, cutoffs for age and for tissue Doppler imaging for both the lateral and the mitral, medial mitral analysts, the transmitral flow propagation velocity, but none of these indices is, 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 is load independent completely. And it, I mean, combination of multiple abnormalities and everything gives you a certain direction, but you cannot really diagnose with certainty because there's so many more factors at play. And frankly speaking, for cardiologists, it may make a difference because these are patterns that do not change that acutely. And if you want to change the grade of the patient, that you change the response to therapy. For example, you know, ACE inhibitors to reduce the afterload, to reduce the LVH, to give you know, diuretics to reduce the preload, and that over time could make a difference, but not so much acutely or the circumstances that we see in the operating room. So there ain't much that we can do to change the filling abnormalities very quickly in a patient despite reducing the preload acutely or increasing it in that sense. And also, as we have discussed that over time, everybody's you know, pattern changes from normal to impaired relaxation. That leads to a slightly elevated left atrial pressure and the pattern tends to pseudo-normalize and it looks normal. Similarly, the impact of having you know, very high left atrial pressures and reduced compliance, which means a very, diff, a very you know, problematic pushing into the left ventricle. The pattern is the same as that of a very elevated preload without any diastolic uh, dysfunction. So it is completely confusing to verbatim apply those guidelines in the operating room to assess and, to, and, uh, assess and grade the diastolic dysfunction as we as it is seen by the cardiologists in the outpatient clinics with the patient spontaneously breathing supine now we have the patients who are dehydrated we have the patients who are on positive pressure ventilation who are in supine position as opposed to the left lateral that the cardiologists see that we use transesophageal echo we use they use transthoracic echo we have the patients on multiple inodilators and venodilators and inotropes, which have varying effects on myocardial contractility as well as preload. So therefore, the, I agree with them that those, the way they define and the way they classify diastolic dysfunction or in function is not applicable, applicable to our circumstances, and we have to think of something else. And that comes, brings into the fact, how do we take this, all this jargon of all these values and all these different Doppler indices and put them into a practical aspect 
that makes a difference for all of us in making real-time clinical decisions for those patients who are under our care. Our perioperative assessment of diastolic function and dysfunction is based on certain principles that are derived from the American Society of Echocardiography guidelines. Number one is that the progression of filling abnormality goes from impaired relaxation towards reduced compliance, which means initially you have pulling abnormality, which over time deteriorates if not treated and if not managed well into the more advanced stage of diastolic dysfunction, and that is a pushing abnormality, which means when the ventricle becomes stiff. Aging, hypertension, chronic overload, coronary artery disease eventually lead to diastolic dysfunction. And more importantly, diastolic dysfunction precedes the, the development of systolic dysfunction in these patients. Third and the foremost important thing is that left atrial pressure can pseudo-normalize uh, certain uh, changes in certain filling patterns of the left ventricle, but it does not pseudo-abnormalize, which means a normal finding may be erroneous, but an abnormal finding is an abnormal finding, and there's no such thing as a pseudo-abnormal findings. And lastly, the patient population that presents to us for high-risk vascular surgery, as well as cardiac, cardiac surgery, all have diastolic dysfunction. They all have had coronary artery disease. They all have had significant afterload in the form of hypertension and other abnormalities. So the only function of our assessment of diastolic function, dysfunction assessment is to establish that where in the spectrum of this disease does this patient rest? Is he on the impaired relaxation side of the graph or is he on the reduced compliance side of the graph? Or to put it very simply, is he in the pattern where he has trouble in pulling things into the left ventricle or on that side where he has trouble pushing things into the left ventricle? And all of these have huge clinical implications. But let's get to the practical assessment step by step in the next session. Doppler tissue imaging is an integral component of the simplified approach to assess perioperative diastolic function and dysfunction being the least load dependent. Doppler tissue imaging is based on principles of Doppler. It is a change in frequency of returning signals, but in this case, vel velocity of tissues is assessed rather than velocity of blood. So these are high amplitude and low velocity signals, and tissue motion does mimic blood motion, but in a far a lower velocity but a higher magnitude of motion. For this one, a mid-esophageal four-chamber view is obtained and a pulse sample, Doppler, a pulse sample sample of the Doppler tissue is based on the lateral mitral analysis, preferably during a period of apnea to avoid the translational and the respiratory motion of the heart to complicate this Doppler signal. The generally presets available in all modern ultrasound systems to optimize the Doppler for assessment and analysis of tissue velocities. So technically, the pulse wave Doppler sample is placed within one centimeter of the mitral analyst. It can be affected by calcification of the mitral analyst. And what it really assesses is the mitral analyst ascent and descent during systole and diastole that leads to those characteristic waveforms. Then as you can see, with the uh, sample volume in the, in the position of the lateral mitral analyst, it technically assesses the rapid filling phase, that is the E prime wave, the atrial contraction, that is the A prime wave, and the S wave represents the systolic component of the uh, mitral annular uh, ascent of this, uh, in this nature. So therefore, these are the three waves, E prime, A prime, and the S wave, but for the simplified approach, the E prime wave is the most important one. We can also measure the isovolumetric contraction and relaxation times based on the differences in time duration between the end of the A wave and the start of the S wave and the end of the S wave and the start of the, of the E prime wave. However, it is not without its problems. Its uh, E prime wave is determined by LV relaxation. It is dependent on preload, can be impacted by systolic function. With normal or enhanced LV relaxation, preload, the E prime wave increases. E prime are generally not affected by preload in the presence of impaired relaxation. So it becomes a little confusing, but more or less this is one of those parameters this is least affected by the loading conditions. In patients with cardiac disease, the most important part is the E prime wave can be used to correct for the effect of LV relaxation in E waves, that is the transmitral E wave, and E over E prime can be used to predict the left ventricular and diastolic pressure, and that's
what it forms the basis of this simplified approach. So now I will define what our methodology of assessing perioperative diastolic function and dysfunction is. Our assessment starts with a Doppler tissue analysis of the lateral mitral annulus peak velocity. So that is step one. So after the lateral mitral annular Doppler tissue velocity has been obtained, it is corrected for age. Next thing, it is either reduced for age or is normal for age. But if it is reduced for age, as we had discussed earlier, there are no pseudo abnormals. So impaired relaxation is automatically established. That's the first stage of diastolic dysfunction. Now the only question is whether the patient has advanced to a reduced compliance phase of the diastolic dysfunction or not. And for that, we have to do the assessment of diastolic dysfunction in the context of patient's systolic function, as is enumerated by the guidelines. So if the ejection fraction is normal or the ejection fraction is depressed, if it is normal, and E velocity, the Doppler transmital E velocity is obtained and compared to the E prime, that is the Doppler tissue, velocity of the lateral mitral analyst. If it is 13 or more, or the deceleration time is 160 to 200 milliseconds, and the atrial reversal duration, that is the pulmonary venous atrial reversal duration, is more than 30 milliseconds by the duration of the transmital A wave, reduced compliance is established. And in patients with depressed ejection fraction, E over E prime more than or close to 15, deceleration time less than 150 milliseconds, and E over VP more than 25 millis 25, again, reduced compliance is established. Now let's just say, if the corrected E prime velocity, that is the light lateral mitral annular velocity, is normal for age, we have to establish whether this is a true normal or a pseudonormal pattern. To establish true normal, E over E prime has to be less. The flow propagation velocity has to be more than 50 centimeters per second. And the left atrial volume has to be equal to or less than 34 ml per meter square. That's the most important thing. At the end of the day, the simplified approach is based on assessing whether the patient has impaired relaxation pattern or has concomitant reduced compliance at the same time because each of these diagnoses has a significant clinical connotation for the patient. Now comes the final section of this presentation and that is to establish the clinical value of this information to, to know on what spectrum does the patient lie at that specific moment in time, whether the patient has an isolated relaxation abnormality, which means does he have only a pulling problem, or he has a concomitant compliance problem, which means a, co a, co a concomitant uh, pushing problem. So both of these have different, um, uh, different uh, implications clinically. For example, if the patient has an isolated relaxation abnormality, this means the patient needs a higher left atrial pressure to overcome the relaxation abnormality to to force the blood into the left ventricle simply by virtue of a higher gradient. Therefore, these patients need a higher preload, which means they're preload tolerant. They need a longer diastole to overcome this active relaxation abnormality. So therefore, they're filling time dependent. Therefore, they should be slower. They, they're tachycardia intolerant. And lastly, the atrial kick contributes almost 50% of their filling of left ventricle during diastole. So therefore, they are sinus rhythm dependent. So a patient who has an isolated relaxation abnormality, we need to maintain sinus rhythm. We need to avoid tachycardia. We need to prolong the filling time by inducing bradycardia. And finally, increase the pre preload by increasing the left atrial pressure. Now let's go to the situation if the patient has a reduced compliance or a pushing abnormality which means the left atrial pressure is already very high and it's very easy to push these patients into congestive heart failure. So these patients are preload intolerant. Now they have a very elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressure because they have a reduced compliance. 
So they need to have a higher aortic diastolic pressure to maintain a higher coronary perfusion pressure to perfuse their myocardium. So they are preload tolerant. They need to have a higher, a higher sorry, pre afterload tolerant, which means they need to have a higher afterload. And lastly, this, because of compliance, their stroke was compliance problem, their stroke volume is fixed. We cannot increase their stroke volume because the ventricle is already like a stiff balloon. So the only way sometimes to enhance their cardiac output is to make them fast. So therefore, these patients are bradycardia intolerant. We do not need to make them slow. We do not and we should not increase the LA pressure excessively because that's going to cause very quick pulmonary edema. And of course, we have to maintain a relatively higher afterload so that they can perfuse their myocardium. So as you can see in this situation, that what we need to establish is whether the patient has impaired relaxation abnormality only or an isolated impaired relaxation abnormality, or the patient also has a concomitant stiffness or a compliance problem because both of these scenarios demand a completely opposite uh, forms of clinical management. This is implied logic. You really don't need to do you know, a double-blinded randomized study to prove this thing. So therefore, the knowledge and apl application of these guidelines in perioperative specific fashion can have significant uh, uh, implications for the clinical management of these patients in the operating room. Now I'll come to the last section, and that is the preoperative risk stratification. So I will analogize diastolic dysfunction to diabetes again, and blood glucose to LV filling. Now again, insulin, the most important determinant of blood glucose, not the only one. LV relaxation is the most important determinant of LV filling, but it is not the only one. A normal pattern, a normal level of glucose does not exclude diabetes. A normal filling pattern does not imply that the patient does not have diastolic dysfunction. An abnormal glucose does not imply the patient have diabetes. An abnormal filling pattern could be because of a preload situation. A blood glucose can change from normal to abnormal without a change in the insulin level. And a pattern, filling pattern of the left ventricle can change from normal to abnormal in the absence of a relaxation abnormality by simply loading changes. So therefore, what is the chronic long-term market of diastolic dysfunction as we have something for diabetes that is HbA1c. So for the diastolic filling abnormalities, the left atrial size is the HbA1c of diastolic function because it's the barometer of chronically elevated left ventricular pressure that, that, that leads to chronically elevated left atrial size and left atrial pressure. So therefore, in the absence of mitral stenosis or significant mitral regurgitation. And a large left atrium simply implies the patient has a pre-existing left ventricular filling abnormality. So if there's one thing to look at in the preoperative evaluation of these patients in transthoracic echoes, that's the left atrial size, which is normalized for the body surface. If that is elevated, which means the patient has significantly elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And now you can tailor your perioperative management based on where does this patient lie in, on, the, on the spectrum of the disorder, either on the earlier impaired relaxation or the more advanced reduced compliance phase. So in conclusion, we spend two-thirds of our life in diastole. And despite that, our assessment of myocardial function is very systolic-centric. We have to rationally and logically look at the left ventricular filling to optimize and tailor fashion our therapy for a specific patient at that moment in time. And we also know that systole and diastole are a continuum. You cannot contract as well and cannot eject as well if you don't relax and fill before that. One depends on the other. And possibly global myocardial function is a better term than using uh, systolic or diastolic function. Thank you and enjoy.